Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Man, today has been a good day. I got a nice little nap for about 45 minutes. Then the phone rang, and I had to get in, get back into business. But I tell you what, um, I uh, had to talk to our church family today on uh, on a Facebook Live to kind of give them some updates after our governor, you know, made uh, announcement today that uh, all the schools are closed in South Carolina. And uh, so uh, just just made a few adjustments here and there. And, and uh, it was interesting. I was sitting outside up there at Phil's cabin, and I was down there uh, on the lower level on one of the picnic tables sitting there. And uh, so, you know, I, I was watching. You know, when you're on Facebook Live, I just had my phone set up there, and I was watching how many people were on live. I think it got up to 60, 65 people watching here and all that stuff, be trying to be serious. And then all at once, four ducks came up behind me there, and one of them even showed his head in the picture just quack 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 and you know, got got everybody's attention and um so i i uh, so phil i'm talking about your ducks man and um and uh so uh, so those ducks started quacking there and and everything and uh i said don't pay any attention to the ducks but man i couldn't say anything and i i just started laughing and uh you know it, I, but i think it was man i think god sent those ducks just to kind of make us all just a little bit more relaxed about the whole situation you know but you know but here, here's what i want to talk about tonight if you go to Luke chapter 10, uh, we're going to talk about a, uh, a story in the Bible that I believe is, is a perfect case of somebody losing their focus. And man, I tell you what, with everything we have going on in our world right now, in our country, I tell you what, this is not the time to lose your focus. This is the time to regain your focus and, and make sure that we know what we're all about and we need to know, church, that Jesus Christ is number one. Amen? Not even a close second, a number one. And uh, so, uh, but, but, but when we uh, look at this story uh, in the Bible about Mary and Martha, and I realize that when we talk about Mary and Martha around church people, you know, the question always comes up, are you a Mary or are you a Martha? And, um, and, and so, uh, and, and, and sometimes we take offense to, you know, to that because Mary and Martha had two different lifestyles. And I want to read these to you, and then we'll get into the Word. It says, and by the way, once again, we're in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet. Check this out, church. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted. Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. <clears throat> she came to him and asked, Lord, watch this, this is Martha asking, the distracted one, don't you care? I mean, look at this. She's asking the Savior of the world, don't you care? This is exactly what she's saying. Don't you care that my sister, and I want you to notice something. She should have, I mean, if that was me talking about my brother, I would have said, Lord, don't you care that my brother Richard? There's no name mentioned here, is it? Now, there's a reason for that, I think. She said, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset by, about many things but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. If Mary chose what was better, what was that better thing? It was sitting at the feet of Jesus and worshiping him. That was way better than what Martha was displaying. But now, let's get back to this idea that when, when the question comes up, are you a Mary or are you a Martha? You know, we just now laid out the, the, the playing field. A little bit about Mary, a little bit about Martha. So the question is, which one are you? And, and now I will tell you where I stand. I stand like this. Why, why can't we be both? Why can't we be a Martha but sit at the feet of Jesus like Mary did first and then start worshiping and, or serving Jesus? Why can't we worship first, then serve? But, you know, uh, have you ever heard the old adage, the old joke about that's when the fight started? You remember? That? Let me tell you one of these. It says, a story said, I took my husband to a restaurant after we had an argument. 
the waiter for some reason took my order first and said I'll, I'll have a sirloin steak rare please and the waiter said aren't you worried about the mad cow and she said no he can order for himself and, and, and that's when it says and that's when the fight started but you know a lot of times when we talk about Mary and Martha we say which one are you are you a Mary that's when the fight starts you know in the church and um, so um, so the story of Mary and Martha always seems to spell some kind of trouble it seems like a, a, a lot of times and but you know whenever I preach on on this passage once again out of the Bible a number of people will say I think Martha was right or I mean I mean you you just can't ignore all these things that's needed to be done around the church or in the kingdom of God somebody has to do these things amen that's exactly right and um, and, and I even heard a person say about this says I don't think Jesus was very fair to Martha do you pastor I don't think Jesus was very fair well I'm not going to judge the intents and the motives of Jesus so uh, uh, but you know it, but it's just like this though even in real life somebody is always stuck to do the, the hard work or the dirty work it's just like you know when 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 all this blows over all this uh, sickness and virus it's all going to end soon and we're going to get through it on the other side and and uh, and, and and July is going to come and you're going to have a big old family cookout and you're going to have 30 or 40 people you know in your house watching tv on a hot summer day on the air conditioning and somebody's going to, have to be outside in 95 degree weather flipping hamburgers and that's just the way it is somebody's stuck with that somebody has to do you know you know the the hard work and we might be that person just like martha and saying lord can't you send somebody out here off of that couch and 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 and, and come out here and help me you know but 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 here's the thing the story of Martha the worker and Mary the worshiper is what we're talking about. It illustrates a very spiritual principle. If I was if I was to describe how we should land between these two good women, I would say this. We please God the most when we learn to sit at his feet in adoration and worship before we try to serve him in our own strength. I mean, the church. there's a lot of people in the church that's bad about that, of serving the Lord in our own strength just because somebody's needed and we're a warm body. So I, I think that, that it's, it's best when we learn to sit at the feet of Jesus and then we start serving him in his strength. And so, uh, so here we are with these two ladies. Martha was doing her best. She was a good worker, and she wanted to give Jesus the very best. But it says these words that is an indictment against Martha. Martha was distracted. Distracted with all of her preparation. Maybe Martha was at a point where, you know, she was distracted, and she became so busy serving God that she forgot about that she needed the presence of God. Man, I'll tell you what, to be honest with you, I, I am uh, right now serving as the director of operations in the South Carolina district of the Wesleyan Church. And we have 66 pastors, and I stay in close contact with these pastors. And, and I'll be honest with you, there are a few right now that are distracted because they are doing everything. They're doing everything that needs to be done, but they're not receiving the main thing, and that's worship and sitting at the feet of Jesus. And, uh, and here, here's what the Bible says about that, though. Then I want to give you a few things I want to, I think, that happens when we lose our focus. Uh, you know, the Bible says in, Mark, in Matthew 6, verse 24, that no one can serve two masters. See, this is why we have to put Jesus first and foremost. No one can serve two masters because he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. For this reason, I say to you, don't be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. He also taught in Matthew 4, verse 4, that people cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so, so, so the way I look at this is that, is that we can live without food, but we cannot live without the bread of life. We have to have Jesus first, and then we serve him 
in the strength of God. Let me look at three things this, this evening. When I lose my focus, if I lose my focus and I get so busy serving God and, and, and not worshiping God and not spending time in His presence, in, in this story here, there are three things that are just so easy to spot, I think, that could have happened. Here's number one. When I lose my focus, it causes me to question God's care. Look what happens here in verse 40. The first thing that Martha says, Lord, don't you care? She lost her focus. She forgot who Jesus really was. So she was, she was so busy that there now is an accusation, accusation in her voice. Lord, you're not paying attention. Aren't you paying attention to what's going on here? Don't you see all the work that I'm doing? Lord, do something. Don't you care about me? We're, we're, it's possible that you and I could do that if we lose focus. I think Martha was angry at Jesus because he continued to let the situation go on and on and on and notice that Martha addressed her irritation at Jesus. Now, you have to admit one thing. Martha sure was a gutsy woman. She sure was. She was a gutsy lady to look at the, the king of all kings, the savior of the world, and say, Jesus, don't you care? Should, man, we don't have to think twice about that. We know how much God cares about us. And, and so, but I wonder sometimes if we have ever wondered if God cares for us. I'll be the first transparent one here. Yes, that's me. I've been there and done that. I've been there and done that. There, there have been things that has happened in my life that, that weren't supposed to happen. They weren't planned to happen like that. And I have sit and late at night wondering, God, where are you? Don't you care? And I think that part of revival is when the church, we start admitting these things that go on in the deep recesses of our heart and our mind that causes us to wonder if God really cares about us or isn't he paying attention to us or couldn't he just fix the situation but he seems like he sits in silence so where are you at tonight what's going on in your life that that you feel like that's you know you're you're tempted to think God where are you where are you Lord I mean, doesn't, don't you care about me? Are you just going to sit back and do nothing? In Mark chapter 4, verse 37 and 38, there's a scripture I think is coming up on the screen here. Here's a little story. It says this, A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. It says Jesus was in the stern, watch this, sleeping on a cushion. Wow, there it is again. And it says, the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, here it is, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care if we drown? So what I'm saying, if the disciples are tempted to talk like that, then I can guarantee you, people like you and I, we get down so low sometimes, so distressed, so strung out, so uh, uptight about the situations around us that we will probably think the same thing. That's why we have to stay a straight and narrow focus on Jesus. But let me finish that. It's not on the screen, I don't think, but it's important to note that Jesus didn't sleep through, the, through all of this despair. The Bible says in verse 39, I don't know if you have it up there or not, he said, he arose and rebuked the wind, and watch this, he said unto the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Man, when we have confidence in the captain, there could be calm in the cabin. Amen? And, and so, so, so Jesus said those three simple words, peace be still, and, and there was this great calm. So those that profess Christ like we do, we should be encouraged that, 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 that he responds to the cries of the sincere that's why on that call that I had with my congregation today, you know, I, I declared that Wednesday would be from 6 to 8 p.m. that this would be a two-hour prayer focus for everybody around their houses, their, their, their homes, and, and wherever they are. Just pray for two hours and pray nothing for, for, for this wave of virus that we have going on, that God would just show up and do something. 
And, and, and I believe that, 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 that we need to have the faith, like we talked about this morning, that knowing that God can when it's his will. Amen? God can in his time. And, 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 and so we, we must understand that God has all power, all authority to rebuke the winds. And as Brother um, uh, said just a little bit ago, that there is nothing catching God by surprise. God is not caught off guard. God is never down to his last nickel. God will show up when it's God's time. Amen? And so, uh, but, but man, we get so distracted. And, and I, I want to look at a few verses of Scripture that, that uh, if you just want to write these down real quick, that goes right along with that. Remember what Jesus said, the Word says in Hebrews 13, verse 5. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. That verse actually comes from the Old Testament. And then it's right there in, this, in the New Testament. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is enough for us. And then in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, the Bible says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for good and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Amen? God is enough. And then in Luke chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, we read this again. It says, Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Even the very head, uh, very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear, it says. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Let me ask you something, church. Have you ever seen a nervous bird? You ever seen an anxious bird? Man, we have a bird sanctuary in my backyard. My wife goes up there to Winsless Grocery and buys these great big bags of bird food. And man, I tell you what, I'm gonna get a little sidetracked here. But she buys these bird bags of bird food. We got bird feeders everywhere. But man, we can't keep squirrels out of those bird feeders at all. And uh, but man, I'll tell you what, she'll she'll be gone on a trip for a day or two, and and I don't know. I just don't get into these birds. Like I know God's gonna take care of them, just like the Bible says. But these birds will sit out there and watch me when I'm sitting out there drinking my tea, and just thinking, man, I just can't wait till your wife gets back. I mean, they know it's going to be an easy lunch when she gets back. She's going to go out there and fill those things clear to the top, and I'm just sitting there saying, no, you know what? The Bible says that God's going to take care of you. But you know, he says that. But you never see an anxious bird. You never see a nervous bird. You never see a scared bird. Because God will take care of them, but man, he will certainly, certainly take care of us. I mean, there may be times, though, when you, when you want God to speak and he doesn't. All of God's saints, all the way from the book of Genesis, clear to the Revelation, you'll, you'll find that if we live long enough, we are all led into a lonely, weary wilderness many times. The Bible says in the book of Job, Job 30, verse 20, he says, I cry to you for help, and you do not answer me. I stand, and you only look at me. But we know how that turned out. And God took care of Job in his time. And then King David was another story in Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2. David said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you don't answer, and by night, but I find no rest. See, David was going through a season. And he was crying out because he wanted God to answer, and God was silent. Here's how I want to sum that, this part up. We should never judge the silence of God as unconcerned for us. Never judge the silence of God as unconcerned for his people. He knows what we're going through and he will always watch over you. God is right where God needs to be. Okay, we're talking about losing our focus. I see another thing that Martha that happened to Martha here. When she lost her focus, she started finding fault with other people. Boy, that happens a time or two around the church. When she lost her focus, she started finding fault with other people. Now, in verse 40, Martha finally explodes with anger, and she comes out of the kitchen boiling mad, and she says, Lord, watch this, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work alone? You know, I don't get angry a lot. I've been angry several times. I grew up with three brothers and a, and a little sister. And I remember many times that, um, 
when my mom was scared and, and she couldn't find one of us, she would always say our whole name, first name, middle name, last name. Timothy Allen Jones, where are you? But when she was angry, a lot of times she wouldn't even use our name. She would just go grab the belt and spank us with us and, and sit us in a corner somewhere, and that was it. And I wonder sometimes, is that what is causing Martha not to call out her sister's name? Or just like saying, why don't you get that woman to help me? Well, that's not good, is it? Get that woman to help me. It's just like, you know, we just don't have enough respect and love and compassion right now to use her name uh, in, in, in our sentence. So, so, so she doesn't call her by her name. I think that maybe it's because she's mad at the world and those who are close to her should know it. I mean, how can she just leave me out here to fend for myself? Can't my sister even come and help me? Can't she see what's going on? What does she think? She's, she's just sitting there doing nothing. Losing focus causes our anger to take, to take things out on other people. Have you ever been around somebody that when they got mad, you didn't even want to be in the same neighborhood? You see, th this is something that I think that, that needs to be taught in my church more often, a lot of churches more often, where Christians gather. And I'll say this. This, this might be something just, this just free. I mean, it, I don't know who the Holy Spirit is speaking it to. But I'll tell you this. I am my very best when I'm away from my wife and my family. I can be my very worst in my own home. That's just human nature. We, we, we are usually our very best or our very worst right there with those that we love the most. But man, when we get outside, you know, we go out to Kroger, or we go out to the church, or we go out to the ball game. Man, we're just Mr. Civic. You know, we're just Mr. Everything. You know, we just act our best. We do our best because that's what the public will see. But we are usually, our, the anger that, that, that Satan brings up on us usually comes out around those that we love the most. I mean, it, it even... Uh, I was in a doctor's office not long ago, and I was reading in a little Reader's Digest I picked up there, and I found this little story. It said the woman went to the doctor for a consultation. The doctor said, how do you feel when you wake up in the morning? Do you wake up grumpy? And she said, well, sometimes I wake up grumpy, but on most mornings I just let him sleep. You know, that maybe, you know, that's just how it works sometimes. But I'm telling you, church, that, listen, listen, so, sometimes the anger, listen, in, in our homes really 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 hurts the other person and I really feel like the Holy Spirit wanted me to share that tonight it, in our homes the explosion may not kill us but the shrapnel might I mean it might not be the explosion we can always say we're sorry you see that's the way it works and our loved ones forgive us and we just go on that's great but it's that shrapnel that usually hurts the most and there are people that when they get mad, they're mad at the world, and we take it out on those that we love the most. I don't know why, but I just feel like right now, let's just bow for prayer, and I just want to pray for our, for our homes. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my home first. I pray for the pastor's home. I pray for Todd's home. I pray for all of us here, Lord, that, that represent family. God, we have something going on in our world right now that we might need to be spending more time inside here in the next few months. We might be having to spend more time with each other. We might have to spend more time, Lord, away from the crowd and, and with those that are we are closest to. And I pray, God, that right now every one of us can be just forgiven of our anger toward those that we love. Father, I don't know why the Holy Spirit wanted me to stop here and have prayer, but God, you know. So bless us, bless our homes, bless our families, bless the church. And God, help us not to be so distracted with our jobs, with our careers, with the children, with the kids, with the sickness, that we forget that you're right here with us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us the way you do. Amen. In James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, here's what James says. 
He says, But everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And here's why it says that. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. You see, what, what, what God wants from all of us is righteousness so that the world may see him working in us. But the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Okay, the third and final thought that I think that jumps out right here is this. I think that when Martha lost focus, she's just like us, we resort to self-pity. And that's a killer. She resorted to self-pity. Nobody's helping me. Just all by myself here. And, 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 and you know, you know, we know what this boils down to. Martha is feeling that like life is not treating her fair, it's just not right, that I'm being treated this way. No one should have to do all the work that I'm doing by myself. Nobody cares about me. And this becomes the world of self-pity. Now, to give us all a little bit of mercy here. The Bible was full of people that had self-pity. Matter of fact, let me just name a couple of them. Jonah. Matter of fact, I may, I may preach on Jonah the, a couple of nights this week. And a uh, favorite story of mine. And, uh, but Jonah felt so sorry for himself when God showed mercy on sinners. You remember those Ninevites? Go to Nineveh, went to Tarshish. He didn't want God to save those Ninevites. They probably helped harm and cap capture his family. And he, he felt so sorry for himself that, that God didn't uh, that God sent him to minister to those sinners and he even asked God he said God have you uh, uh, to, to spare him of that and God even said have you any right to be angry Jonah have you any right to be angry Elijah was one of those men in the Old Testament Elijah got so depressed and, and, and felt so bad that he said he would rather die than live because life was too hard on him and God showed up one day and pretty much told him said, you know pretty much like this it's not as bad as it could be and so jo so Elijah started coming out of his funk there and then jealousy shows up in Psalm 73 and King David's life and King David said I have seen the prosperity of the wicked they have no struggles the wicked are out there just sinning away and they have no struggles I've seen it all but you know but 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 when you think about self-pity Self-pity is a dangerous, deceitful, heart-hardening sin. Now, I have spent 27 years in the pastorate, and, uh, and I, uh, your pastors may have spent longer than I have, but I can tell you where God has put me in three different churches, I have seen that, that self-pity is one thing that will pretty much hurt the church if it gets out into the church. If we feel sorry for ourselves, like we're not getting the, our fair share, and let me just talk just for a minute about, about uh, self-pity. A.W. Tozer even said that self-pity, is, is it, it chokes our faith, it drains our hope, it kills our joy, it smothers our love, it fuels our anger, and, and it robs any desire to serve other people. When self-pity shows up, like I'm not getting my fair share, I'm doing all the work, nobody's recognizing me. And, um, and, and, and here's my opinion on it. What I have seen, I've, I've kept good notes over the years of talking to people through things like self-pity or whatever else is, is, is hurting them. Self-pity becomes a feeder sin. And what I mean by a feeder sin is, is, is this. Many times, self-pity causes us to be self-indulgent. And here's what it leads to. Self-pity leads to gossip. When we start feeling sorry for ourselves so much, you know, we, we tell other people why. And we, that leads to gossip. It leads to slander. It could even lead to gluttony. Because we feel so sorry for ourselves, we want to now please ourselves. And, and then substance abuse. Pornography. I'm not getting my fair share in life. So pornography is so easy to obtain. And self-pity can lead to that. And I'll tell you what else it leads to. It leads to binge entertainment. You know, when we start feeling down so low, now we just go and just stock up on the 
the wine for the next six weeks or the beer or the whiskey or whatever else, and we just indulge, 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 and that all starts a lot of times because of self-pity and, 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 and not getting our fair share in life. And those are just a few, and, and it poisons our relationships, and, and, and a lot of times it's the underlying cause of Christian burnout, of spiritual burnout. But, but let me get back on the, on the text here real quickly. And in verse 40, but the Bible says what, once again that Martha was distracted. Distraction led to all of that. Now, let me read to you real quickly what, what one uh, dictionary says distracted means. It says this. In the sense of this word distracted means to be pulled away or to be dragged away and taken captive. All right, now let, let's put this into context. In other words, to be taken captive, to be made a prisoner against your own free will. Now, here's what I think it is here. I think that Martha wanted to sit at the feet of Jesus. I think she wanted to be at his feet. She also wanted to be sitting beside her sister Mary. But she was being pulled away and taken captive by her sense of duty. I don't think there was much wrong with Martha, except she was taken captive. She was pulled away. Duty called, somebody's got to get it done, it might as well be me. You know, those other people won't do anything, I might as well do it. A lot of us are like that. And then what happens, we get pulled away, taken captive, and now we don't get the chance to sit at the feet of Jesus. And now that captivity leads to frustration, it leads to loss of focus. It leads to blaming others. And it leads to many, many different things. And self pity is one of them. Fretting about the meal robbed her of the joy of listening to the Lord. Look how easy it is to get off focus. Fretting about the meal has robbed her of the joy of listening to God. And we should, of course, take our responsibility seriously, but not to the point of neglecting to listen to Jesus. I need to take my role seriously. i got to get up tomorrow morning and do an awful bu- a whole lot of work. Many pastors everywhere is going to have to do a lot of work, getting their people encouraged and keep the faith and making plans. It might be a different course. We can't get distracted. We have to keep the focus. And make sure, though, that we keep sitting at the feet of Jesus. But, and so Jesus says to her, and I get ready to close, he says this, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. The thing that is necessary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, soaking in the Word, and letting the Holy Spirit live through us and give us peace and faith and joy. That's what's necessary. And then once we get that, God will gladly use us to serve him, not in our strength, but in his own strength. See, that's why I love Matthew 6, 33. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, not second. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen? Every single one of these things. You see, we can be so busy with the things of life that we become so distracted about what's going on that we miss Jesus. We get so busy, so distracted, we miss Jesus. And if we go through this busy world, we lose our focus. There's something that I've been doing every single Sunday in, in, our, in our church, uh, every service. I preach about three times a week, and at the end of each service, I say this, these three questions. What did the Holy Spirit say to you in the last half hour? What did the Holy Spirit tell you? Not your neighbor, not, your, not the one behind you, not the one in front of you. What did the Holy Spirit say to you? Did he, did he show you some things that maybe you could work on and maybe that you could become better at? What did the Holy Spirit say? Number two, what are you willing to do about it? Are you willing to make some changes in your life? Are you willing to slow down a little bit? Let let those other obligations 
they will be there when you get away from the feet of Jesus. So number one, what did the Holy Spirit tell you? What are you willing to do about it? And then number three, how can we help pray? So I would just like to close tonight and just maybe just bow our heads. I don't know if you had a song tonight, Todd. It's, you know, we're good, I think. Is that all right? Yeah, okay. But I just think that maybe we can just bow our heads right where we are. If you want to come to the altar and pray, that's fine, but right there at your seat. Let's just bow our heads for a moment. And let the Holy Spirit minister to you this, this evening. Let the Holy Spirit speak. Speak peace to your spirit. Speak peace to your soul. Are you a Mary or are you a Martha? You could be a Mary today and a spirit-filled Martha tomorrow. You just sit at his feet. some changes and if you're here this evening and you say yes pastor God has spoken to me and I'm going to be open to making changes so I can spend more time at his feet would you raise your hand God bless you amen amen praise the Lord anybody else amen, amen. let's all stand father in the name of the father Son and the Holy Spirit, we give you this day. God, you've been very, very generous to us today. You've been very good. And Father, we just want to thank you. God, I want to thank you for these wonderful folks right here tonight. And thank you for their transparency, Lord. And I just ask you, God, to bless each one of us as we go from this building. Father, we're walking out into a brand new world. We're walking out into the world this week, Lord, that's going to have people driving down the highways that probably have fear about what's next. How's this all going to end? God, would you use us, God, to bring peace and healing to people? God, would you allow us, Lord, to spend some time tonight and maybe even tomorrow morning at your feet? soaking up the power, soaking up the joy and so that, God, we can go out into this world and not operate in our own strength but operate in the Spirit's strength. God, please show us, up. Show us, Lord, what we must change and bless us. God, I just want to thank you once again for Brother Todd and Terry and Phil and the leadership of this church and, God, for each one that's here tonight. Let us make a difference. And, God, if you allow... Bring us back tomorrow, Lord, for another time of great worship and fellowship together. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said together, amen. amen. God bless you.